We can open your Bibles again to the book of Nehemiah. Nehemiah, we've spent two weeks uh, looking at chapter 1, and now we're into chapter 2. We've already learned that Nehemiah was a godly man, a Jew living far off in Susa, uh, the capital city of the Persian Empire. And one day he hears a tragic report about the state of affairs back in Jerusalem. Uh, In chapter 1, verse 3, the report that the remnant there are in great distress and reproach, and the wall of Jerusalem is broken down and its gates are burned with fire. And he's so affected by this news, the next verse says, I sat down and wept and mourned for days. I was fasting and praying before the God of heaven. And then he tells us exactly how he was praying in in verses 5 through 11 of chapter 1. We studied his prayer last week and we noted the specific thing he asked for at the end. He requests, make your servant successful today and grant him compassion before this man. Now I was cupbearer to the king. He was praying that God would give him an opening, an opportunity to talk to the king about things back in Jerusalem and that God would grant success. And so today we see how God answered that prayer in the first eight verses of chapter 2. So we'll read those together. Feel free to stand up if you'd like to uh, while we read these verses from the Bible. Nehemiah 2 verse 1, And it came about in the month of Nisan that in the twentieth year of King Artaxerxes that wine was before him, and I took up the wine and gave it to the king. Now I had not been sad in his presence So the king said to me, why is your face sad, though you're not sick? This is nothing but sadness of heart. Then I was very much afraid. I said to the king, let the king live forever. Why should my face not be sad when the city, the place of my father's tombs, lies desolate and its gates have been consumed by fire? Then the king said to me, what would you request? So I prayed to the God of heaven. I said to the king, if it please the king, and if your servant has found favor before you, send me to Judah, to the city of my father's tombs, that I may rebuild it. Then the king said to me, the queen sitting beside him, how long will your journey be, and when will you return? So it pleased the king to send me, and I gave him a definite time. And I said to the king, if it please the king, let letters be given me for the governors of the provinces beyond the river that they may allow me to pass through until I come to Judah. And a letter to Asaph, the keeper of the king's forest, that he may give me timber to make beams for the gates of the fortress, which is by the temple, for the wall of the city and for the house to which I will go. And the king granted them to me because the good hand of my God was on me. You may be seated. So Nehemiah is the king's cupbearer, the manager of his wine cellar. And he would taste the wine before serving it to the king. This was to protect the king from being poisoned, which is a big problem in those days. And so this day, the king notices Nehemiah's sadness in verse 2. And that led, as Nehemiah had been praying, to a conversation with the king about why he was so sad, about the trouble back in Jerusalem. And Nehemiah goes on to ask the king if he might himself go to Jerusalem and rebuild it, he says. The king grants that request and then gives him all that he asked for in terms of resources and more beyond. And it's a great answer to Nehemiah's prayers. But I realized something else about this passage this week. That we have in these eight verses a description of how to embrace a new ministry opportunity. How to embrace a new ministry opportunity. Many Christians want to be used by the Lord in a greater way. Many Christians are praying, Lord, give me more to do. Lord, I want to serve you better. I want to accomplish more. I want to be more fruitful. Many Christians have heart burdens about certain needs like like Nehemiah had. 
And they're, they're wanting God to guide them into some new arena of ministry. Uh, maybe some area of service or area of teaching or outreach or whatever. And they're not sure, though, how that's going to happen. How, how's God actually going to bring this about? What's this going to look like? How do I respond to an opportunity? How do I seize it? How do I know that God is really opening the door for me and I should run through it? Some Christians never accomplish very much for the Lord. Um, maybe they're too tentative. Maybe they're just kind of lukewarm. Maybe they're actually kind of lazy. Uh, other Christians are sort of on the opposite extreme. They, they're trying to do everything for the Lord. And, and they're you know, kind of impulsive, stretch too thin, have their hands in everything. Well, Nehemiah's example helps us to avoid both extremes, both ditches here. And, and, and so I, I think we can notice in these, these seven good things he did, um, some really practical, helpful insights in how to seize a new ministry opportunity. Well, the first thing that Nehemiah did right is he excelled in his present position, his current spot. Before he went on to the new thing, he was doing well at the thing he was already involved in. A cupbearer, a cupbearer doesn't sound like a big deal to us, but in, in those times, it was a big deal. It was a position of great responsibility. The king was literally trusting this guy with his life every day. If you wanted to kill the king, you only had to bribe one dude, <laughs> the dude that was, that was serving him the wine every day, and you could get to the king. And so you, the king trusted Nehemiah in a big way, and, and then naturally the king got to know him personally, and he developed a great confidence in Nehemiah. So how does that happen? How do you have a Jewish guy who's basically come from a, a slave captive family, how does he rise up through the ranks somehow to one of the most influential, important positions in the whole court of the empire there? How do you get to a spot like that? Well, the Bible doesn't tell us, but I, well, we know Nehemiah a little bit, and we can guess the guy must have been just exceptionally competent, loyal, likable, reliable. He must have had a great reputation. He must have had an, a sterling character. Um, everybody knew, you know, that guy, that guy, that Nehemiah guy, I know he's Jewish and stuff, but that guy works hard. That guy, that guy you can, he can handle whatever you throw at him. He's easy to deal with. It reminds me of Daniel. You know, Daniel lived just a, just a, you know, a generation before uh, Nehemiah. Daniel, Daniel was in, in Babylon and that in that pagan government. And he also rose to a very high position, uh, similar to Nehemiah. See, these guys did not just assume that, hey, because, because, I, because I'm, I, I believe in Jehovah, because I'm a different religion here, therefore I'm just going to be discriminated against and, and persecuted. And, and it's, it doesn't matter. It doesn't matter how hard I try. I'm never going to get any place. They did not assume that. Instead, they, they just excelled. They did all they could do in the position they were in, and, and, and they got promoted anyway. And God used them big time in the high positions that they ended up in. In Nehemiah's case, God clearly used this first career to set him up to prepare him for the second career of, of ministry uh, back in Jerusalem. And, and we see that pattern other places in the Bible. Um, it, you see it with Moses. Uh, we see it with David. We see it with Paul. I mean, we know these guys for their second job. <laughs> But they all had a job before that, or multiple jobs before that. And God used those, their, their, their excellence in those previous careers to set them up for, for the, the bigger thing that we think of in, in terms of their ministry. Those first jobs were not a waste. They were preparatory. Remember the principle Jesus taught. Uh, in Luke, Luke 16, verse 10, he who is faithful in a very little thing is faithful also in much. Nehemiah was faithful in what he had to do right there, just taking care of the wine service. He was faithful in that. 
And God entrusted him with more. Uh, That verse in Ecclesiastes 9, verse 10, Whatever your hand finds to do, do it with all your might. Um, so, so, so that's where we begin. You know, what's already right in your hand? What can you do right now for the Lord? Are you excelling in that right now? Uh, are you being faithful there? You're doing your best there. Sure, the Lord might use you in another way in the future, but are you faithful in the present? The second thing we see in Nehemiah that's, that's so good is that he patiently waited for God to open the door. He waited for God to open things up. Uh, now, we, we, we've talked before what strong feelings he had about the situation in, in Jerusalem. But he was content to keep doing his regular job. Praying a lot. We talked about the praying. And just waiting. Waiting for God. Waiting for God to bring something about. Lord, if you want me doing something else. If you want me to go over there. You can open it up. You can make that happen. Um, and, and, and he continued on that way for, for about four months, it seems like. Just waiting, watching, praying, looking to see if God would open it up. Now, now for us, when we, get, when we get emotionally worked up about something, I mean, it's, it's hard to wait. Man, you want to you get in there, you want to make something happen, you know. Um, Christian zeal can be impulsive in a way that's, that's, that's unhelpful. Uh, and when you're, when you're feeling that, it can be super hard to just wait. To just wait on God's time. Uh, wait for God to open that door. Wait for God to make His guidance clear. You, you feel like, well, time is slipping away. We're losing the opportunity here. Let's get going. And, and it, it's hard to wait. You know the famous quote from Hudson Taylor. You've heard this before. He says, it's not lost time to wait on God. It's not lost time. To wait upon the Lord. Because see, during that waiting, praying phase, God's doing things then too, isn't He? God's doing things to you. He's changing you during that time. He's getting you in the spot you need to be in in order to do the thing. And He's also changing circumstances out there. He is arranging a bunch of stuff providentially so that when it is His time, everything just fits right together. And then things might happen real fast at that point. Um, And that's how it is in the story here, right? Wait, 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 wait. And then boom, it all happens. And that's what we see in the story. And so often it works that way in our own lives. But we we have to be patient first or we'll make a big mess of it before, (laughs) before that can develop. A third thing Nehemiah did right here in seizing this ministry opportunity and, and I think this is, this is really helpful for us, is that he admitted his own fear. He admitted his fear of the personal risk he was taking. Um, Nehemiah, you know, has this really special, comfortable position there in the palace. He had one of the best jobs around. And, but he realized he was risking that whole thing on this one conversation with the king. He realized... I'm, going to, I'm about to cross a bridge here. I'm not going to be able to go back on. And I don't know how this is going to turn out. When he showed this sadness in verse 2, uh, myself and, and, and I think a lot of the commentators believe that was, that was something he did on purpose. It wasn't that his emotions were so out of control he couldn't contain it. I mean, this is four months later after the bad news. I think he intentionally showed a degree of emotion there in the hope that it would lead to a conversation with the king about, about Jerusalem. Um, But this was risky in itself. This was against the rules of the court. Servants were not to show their own emotions there. This was not about a servant. This was about the king. Um, And so he's breaking the rules. And and when the king notices the sadness in verse verse 2, Nehemiah feels a stab of fear. He says so. He says, I was very much afraid. He knew things could go bad. Right at this point. Persian kings in the Bible. If you read these, these, these chapters, Daniel, Daniel Esther, and, and Nehemiah, these guys are kind of fickle, kind of unpredictable, and they can do extreme things. I mean, they can just kill people that offend them. 
And, and so this is a risky deal. We also know from Ezra that this same guy, Artaxerxes, went very early in his reign, years before, he opposed the rebuilding of the temple back in Jerusalem. And, and God had to work it out a different way where that got done. And so, and so it's like, well, is he, is he still mad about that? Now, what's he going to think about Jerusalem? See, that's risky. And, and the more you think about it, I mean, Nehemiah's whole plan is just full of riskiness. I mean, guys, what does a cupbearer know about doing this gigantic civil engineering project of, of rebuilding this wall around Jerusalem? What does he know about that? He's never been to Jerusalem in his life. He knows very few people back in Jerusalem. What if the situation's a lot different than he imagined? What if the people back there don't even like him? And won't even follow him whenever he gets there. And what about, what about the enemies out there? He has some sense of that he's going to be opposition. Ends up probably being worse than he imagines. What about them? What if they come after him personally? His own life could be at risk. And, and so, so, so he can imagine all the ways that this thing could go bad. And he feels it. He feels intensely fearful in this moment here, uh, probably a sense, look, my whole life is going to hinge on this two-minute conversation with the king today. He felt the risk of the position that he's in. And, and of course, he's been praying about this moment and rehearsing the conversation in his mind a thousand times. But, but it finally happens. And in that moment, he does not feel strong. He feels weak and scared. <laughs> And guys, this blessed me so much this week. The realism of this. Because this is how it feels for me. Every time I've ever taken a little bit of risk in serving the Lord, I felt scared about it. You feel it. You think, wow, a lot is at stake here. You don't feel heroic, right? You feel scared, feel weak often. What a blessing We're, that the Bible is realistic. That we're not studying some kind of plastic superhero guy here. But we're studying a brother with a nature like ours. He got scared like we get scared, but he pressed through and God was faithful to him. A fourth thing we see in, in Nehemiah seizing this opportunity is that he submitted to God-ordained authority. He submitted to God-ordained authority. This, the king was obviously the big authority figure in Nehemiah's life. The king represented the authority of government and the employer uh, that he was serving. And, and Nehemiah appeals to him with great respect and submission. Verse 3, let the king live forever. Verse 5, if it please the king, and if your servant has found favor before you, Verse 7, if it please the king. So even though he enjoyed a pretty special relationship with the king, he doesn't presume on that, but he approaches the man with, with humility. And it worked, didn't it? It worked. It says in verse 6, it pleased the king to send me. He ends up getting the king's full support. Uh, the king gives him all the resources he asked for and, and more beyond and, and, and we, see, uh, we see here that, that Nehemiah believed, this is so important, Nehemiah believed that if God really wanted him to go to Jerusalem and do this thing that was on his mind, that God would, God would work that out through the man that was in authority over him. Um, he believed that God would guide through the authority figure. He believed that God would move the heart of the king to give him favor this way. And I mean, that's how he prays. Make your, you know, the end of, uh, end of chapter one, make your servant successful today and grant him compassion before this man. He's asking for God to move the heart of the king and through that to guide him in his in his his ministry work what an important principle for us in making big decisions and in considering what new stuff the lord might want us to do to be submitted to the authorities that that god has put over us in different ways in our life to to expect that god will steer their hearts and minds that god will lead us through them 
And by authority figures, of course, it could be lots of different people that God uses this way to guide you. It could be, it could be folks like teachers or employers. It could be your parents. It could, it could be your husband. It could be your government officials. Like in this case, it could be pastors, of course. Whoever God has, has put in that kind of position in your life, at least get their counsel and be very cautious to go against against them you see well you say well these people they're just people they're not infallible they could get it wrong in some cases these people aren't even christians right why why should i why should i care so much what they think about my plans well Well, neither was King Artaxerxes here. He was not a Christian. He was lost and pagan as could be. And yet Nehemiah submits the whole thing to him. Trust that God would lead him through the king. Nehemiah honored the man. He wouldn't leave home without his blessing. That's a big deal. You see, before Nehemiah could go off and lead others and have others under his authority... He had to first be under the authority of his king. An independent, unsubmissive attitude works really well in a Clint Eastwood movie or a John Wayne movie or something like that. But it works really bad, really bad in God's economy. God does not bless that kind of an attitude. Uh, Nehemiah submitted to God-ordained authority and God honored that. A fifth thing we see here is that Nehemiah eagerly volunteered himself. He volunteered himself to do it. Number five, uh, the king asked in verse four, what would you request? Just a wide open invitation. What do you want? And he says, I want to go. I want to go send me. To Jerusalem. Send me to Judah, he says, that I may rebuild it. He doesn't say, well, we ought to find somebody good and go send them because I don't want to leave this comfortable spot I'm in. He says, well, I'll go. He volunteers himself for a difficult, dangerous mission. It's, it's one thing to see a problem and analyze the problem and talk to people about the problem and preach about the problem or give money for the problem. But it's quite another thing to tackle the problem yourself and get involved directly, personally, and try to make it better. He says, let me go tackle it. I'm willing to sacrifice. I'm ready to get my hands dirty. Nehemiah did not edge away from the problem like we often do. Say, oh, I think somebody else can deal with that. But he ran toward the problem. He says, what what can I do? Will you send me to go and help? What if he'd he'd done something different? What What if he'd just written some strongly worded letters to those people in Jerusalem and just told them all the stuff they ought to do? Do you think that would have worked? I don't think that would have worked at all. Um, he had to go there himself. He had to be invested. He had to settle in with them. He had to lead them from the front. He had to lead by his own direct personal example on the scene. It's like Isaiah's attitude in Isaiah 6 feel like I've, I've quoted this not too long ago. I can't remember what message it was. But I'll, I'll quote it again. Isaiah 6, verse 8. Uh, it's this vision where he hears the voice of the Lord saying, Whom shall I send? Who shall go for us? And Isaiah says, Here am I. Send me. He volunteers for a really hard ministry. And God says, Go. Go and tell this people. And Gives him his marching orders. Of course, sometimes we're willing and wanting to do something ourselves, but it's not God's will for us to do that thing. Sometimes that's the case. I, I thought of King David. He had this, this really strong desire to build the first temple himself. He's really excited about that. And God says, no, 
God says, you can plan it out. You can provide the materials. But this is a job for your son Solomon to do after you're dead. But I, but I like what else God says to him. This is in 1 Kings 8, verse 18. He says, he says, because it was in your heart to build a house for my name, you did well that it was in your heart. God gives him credit for having a good desire to do something, even though God's answer was no. It's not for you to do. It's for somebody else. Even our good desires are pleasing to the Lord. Regardless of whether you follow through on it. But will you volunteer? Will you say, can I do it? I'm willing. We all see needs around us. We all see needs in the church. It's real easy to see needs and see problems. Uh, and think, wow, you know, somebody ought to do something about that. But hopefully our second thought, our second thought will be, Lord, what do you want me to do about that? Lord, can I help with that somehow? Do you have something for me in this? He eagerly volunteered himself. And then number six, he developed definite plans. He developed definite plans. This comes out in verse six, when the king starts asking specific questions. King says, how long will your journey be? And when will you return? And so, so the, he's asking about timeline here. Okay, how long is this going to take? When do you want to leave? When are you coming back? And, and he says, I gave him a definite time. And so in his own mind, he'd already planned this thing out well enough that he could tell him, yeah, you know, I'm, I'm sure I can wrap this up in six months. Maybe we can leave in about a month and I'll be, be back, you know, a certain, a certain date. He was able to be definite about why? Because he'd made definite plans about it. And then, he, then he, you see that in the next couple of verses, he just goes on to ask for the specific stuff he's going to need to do the job. Verse 7, uh, if it please the king, let letters be given me for the governors of the provinces beyond the river. He's already anticipating political trouble. That he's going to run into and, and probably turns out worse than he imagines. But he knows there's going to be some trouble and he needs to have the king's authority to to handle these guys, these other governors. And and then and then then he's thinking about, well, uh, what about the resources? What about the supplies to build the to build things? There's there's plenty of rocks. There's going to be plenty of rocks for this wall. Uh, but but not much wood, not much timber in that area. And so, so verse 8, he's, he's, he's asking for that too. I, I need a letter to Asaph, the keeper of the king's forest. He may give me timber to make beams for the gates of the fortress, which is by the temple for the wall of the city and for the house to which I will go. So he's already thought through the construction materials he's needed, even including the house that he wants to live in there. Think of the king's position. For a king in this time, I, I would assume, all day long, he is, he is hearing pitches from people that are, that are coming before him and, and trying to convince him that, that, that you know, their idea is a good idea and we should do this project or that thing. We should change this or that. He's hearing this stuff all day long. He's asking questions and having to make decisions on this. And so he's used to this situation, right? And, and if, if Nehemiah did not have definite answers to those questions... I think he would have been dead in the water. The king would have realized, hey, you're not serious about this. You haven't thought this through. There's no real plan here. No, I'm not just going to turn you loose for your little pipe dream in Jerusalem. Uh, but, it was, but instead, it was the opposite. Um, he impressed the king because, because he, had, he had formed a practical plan for how to tackle the task um, here's the resources we need. Here's some, some difficulties we're going to have to deal with. Um, here's a timeline that I can commit to. That was really impressive. See, he wasn't just praying for the last four months. He was also thinking. He was planning. He, he, was, he was sketching out some, some ideas in, in some way. Now, he didn't have a lot of facts, but he was working with all the facts he had. They try to figure out, okay, how can we actually do this? He made it practical, see. Um, and that's a big deal. Uh, this preliminary planning, so he's ready to go when God finally, this day, opens the door and the conversation happens. 
Many of us have ideas of future things the Lord might have us do. You think, well, am I supposed to do this? Am I supposed to? Maybe someday I'll do this. Um, different you know, ministry ideas, whatever. Um, so I challenge you. I challenge you this way. You know, what are, what are you doing right now to prepare for that? Are you really serious about that? Well, is there something you can do now in terms of preparation? Is there research you can do? Are there other people you can talk to who've done similar things? You can learn more about it. Uh, can you give it a trial run somehow? Can you, can you sketch out some kind of plan of how this might work? Nehemiah did those things, and it really, really paid dividends in that conversation with the king. And then finally, the seventh thing we see in Nehemiah is that he, he realized it was God working through him. God was working in this whole deal. And, and we see that in verse 8 and how Nehemiah describes the results of his conversation with the king. He says, the end of verse 8, And the king granted them to me because the good hand of my God was on me. Everything went perfectly in that talk with the king. Couldn't have gone any better. Why? Why did it work out so well that day? Well, we've just been talking about all the things Nehemiah did right. Say, well, it went well because Nehemiah did his part. That's true. But Nehemiah saw things were deeper than that. He saw that this also included the sovereign hand of God in the whole thing. It wasn't just, he, it wasn't just the human responsibility side. It was the divine sovereignty side as well. And Nehemiah, at the end of the day, gives God all the credit. This all worked out, why? Because the good hand, the gracious hand of God was on me in this whole thing. God was helping me. And, and, and boy, this is how you feel. Anytime you've, 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 you've prayed about, it, about something and, and, and anticipated something and rehearsed it in your mind and waited for it and finally it comes, finally it happens, finally the, the, the moment of crisis arises and, 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 it, and God works the thing out. It, it turns out really well. All your prayers are answered. Everything comes together. And at the end of it, you're not, you're not congratulating yourself. Well, I did everything. I had it all planned out. But you're saying, praise the Lord. The Lord helped. The Lord is with me. The Lord's hand was in the whole thing. And that's, and that's such a joyous, joyous experience. Uh, <laughs> And of course, of course, it, so much of that has to do with how much we pray about stuff. You don't pray very much about it. You tend to give yourself all the credit because that's all you're seeing is just your side. But when you've prayed a lot, you, you realize, no, this is God answering my prayers. And, and so last week we talked about Nehemiah's big prayer um, that, that you know, he prayed, he prayed you know, similar thoughts, I think, for, for four months, day and night, he said, and but I, but I want to point out something else here. I want to point out his little prayer in verse 4 of, of chapter 2. Uh, the king said to me, what would you request? The king gives him this wide open invitation. And it says, so I prayed to the God of heaven. That's really neat, isn't it? How do you, how do you think this prayer looked? Do you, th do you think he dropped to the floor and prayed for 15 minutes there in front of the king? I don't think so. I don't think so. I think this was a small, mental, quick prayer, reaching out to God. It's like, Lord, help me. Give me the right words right now for this. I think Nehemiah, and we see this in the whole rest of the book, Nehemiah is a man that just walked with God in such a way that every time he was under pressure, his immediate instinct is to reach out to the Lord in prayer, to look to the Lord for help. And, and here in, the, in this moment of crisis, right in the middle of this, the biggest conversation of his whole life, he's, he's crying out to the Lord, Lord, help me. Help me now in this. In my fear, help me. Strengthen me. Give me the words. And that's why the success comes, because God, God helped him and answered his prayers. Has this ever happened to you? 
something like this? You've thought about it, you've prayed about it, you've imagined it. You're scared and weak, but you push through and God helps, God helps. I tell you, there's nothing better. There is no greater feeling in the world than to come out the other end of that process and be able to say what Nehemiah says here. This all worked because the good hand of my God was on me. It's a joyful thing. To say, God certainly did it. God certainly answered all my prayers. God is with me. I'm not alone here. I'm in step with the almighty God as I'm, as I'm trying to do these hard things. There's no greater joy in the world to live that way. God's with me. God's guiding me. God's using me. No. Think of the confidence this gave Nehemiah as he, he prepared for the big trip, you know. I mean, I mean, he knew there's just massive uncertainty ahead. There's massive difficulty ahead. But he could be absolutely sure God is with me. God's hand is with me. God is in this. God has opened the door. God has made a way. He could be sure that God would then see him through the whole mission. And that's how I feel about the position of our church today. You know, we, we're closing on the building tomorrow, Lord willing. And, and we've seen over the last, the last year, God answer many prayers. God opened some doors for us. His good hand has been upon us without question. And that should encourage us. That should encourage us that it's going to continue to be on us. We can proceed with faith. We can proceed with confidence that He'll continue to help. He'll continue to see us through. There's going to be difficulties. There's going to be all kinds of uncertainties, things we haven't even thought of. Problems of every size and shape are going to arise. But if God's with us, if God's with us, we'll do well. We'll, we'll see his, his triumph. We'll see His work. And we'll find great joy in the process. And so I was blessed so much uh, by, by this analysis of how Nehemiah uh, seized the ministry opportunity that God gives him here in this conversation with the king. Amen.